So again, the purpose of this series is to bring us into alignment with God's kingdom, to make sure that we're on point, on mission, on track with where God has called us to be rather than we ourselves want or deserve or think we deserve or prefer, you name it. We want to be on track with God's kingdom and in alignment with him. And today I want to talk with you about the battle in my mind. The battle in my mind in response to this mission that we have, this theme of this sermon series, and the theme for the year, how do we make sure that we're in alignment with God's kingdom rather than the kingdom of the world or even our own made-up kingdom? Um, We've been trying to see what the kingdom of God looks like, and today we're going to probably get into our minds a little bit. I get into my mind all the time. It's a horrible place. It's terrifying. Um, ask my wife or Pastor Chase because I kind of just let them into my mind all the time, and it's, it's a weird place, man. Um, we're going to go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, as we contend with this idea of the battle within our minds. Uh, I really like the book of Hebrews. Uh, I haven't preached from it much, but it's a really important book. It has a lot of meaning to me. We're coming from this book today because it has a lot to say about the new covenant, about the gospel, about Jesus, and about who he is and what he represents for us as human beings. So if you're here with us today and you're not a believer in Jesus, I'm glad you're here. Um, And this is a great place for you to be, and you are welcome here, and I pray that you learn about Jesus in this place today, because that's everything, to learn about Jesus. And if you're here today and you are a believer in Jesus for a little while or a long while, then I need you to know that today's message is for everyone, but based on scripture, it's more catered for the believer. Not that it's more important for the believer to hear. In fact, it might be a little bit more uncomfortable if you're a believer and you hear this message today. Last week, we talked about the law and understanding the law within the Mosaic Covenant and how Jesus has not abolished the law but fulfilled the law and has shown us that we can't be righteous enough. You have the Pharisees who are the most righteous of righteous people in regards to the law and how they follow and do all these ritualistic rites and practices, and they're almost perfect. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and like a, a, like a crazy statement, like, Jesus, what are you talking about? It doesn't get any better than them. Yeah, you have to be even better than them in order to be considered truly righteous according to God's way. And he goes on and he gives all of these different scenarios of what real righteousness looks like. The law says this. I tell you the truth. It's even harder than what the law just says on paper. Kind of making an impossible situation to get the point across, you can't. You of your own accord cannot be perfect. You cannot acquire your own righteousness. You can work and work and work and work and try and try and try, but it will still result and worthless nothing. The Apostle Paul says, garbage, all of my righteousness. And we talked about how Jesus, when confronted with the reality of our own utter depravity, is the one that makes us holy. And it has nothing to do with our own action. So there's that contention of, how hard do I have to try? I want to keep that conversation going today because I believe that it is likely one of the greatest battles you as a Christian will face. And if you're here not as a Christian, it's giving you a little heads up into something that you might get into should you choose to follow Jesus. But likely it's something that you yourself even face right now. How do I deal with my perspective of myself, the image of myself, which just never seems to be good enough? I can never measure up. I can never meet the standards that I set for myself or for others or the way that I read the Bible as a Christian. I just can't seem to be all that I think I ought to be. The battle in my mind. The context of the book of Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish converts. Primarily people who have Jewish ethnic descent 
and they have followed Jewish law and practice. The author of Hebrews, who we don't know exactly who it is, is writing to a group of Jewish converts to Christianity. So they're still ethnically Jews, but they have recognized that, hey, Jesus has fulfilled the law. And now I don't need to go to the temple and to make sacrifice. I don't need to rigidly follow all these things. And in fact, as we've learned, they were never there for me to perfectly follow. They were there for me to see how hopeless my situation is, but Jesus, but Jesus has come and has set me free from the bondage of sin and has made me righteous and holy and able to be in an eternal relationship with God. That's the gospel that they've accepted and now that they're following. Unfortunately, because of the political and the religious climate of the Roman Empire, it's believed that while individuals recipients of this letter had not yet faced persecution from the author's own mouth in this book. You're not facing persecution to the point of shedding blood. In other words, you at this point, recipients of this letter, you haven't been put to death because of your faith. Maybe they were being imprisoned. Maybe they weren't. Maybe it was just getting harder. Maybe some laws were being passed that were anti-Christian. Maybe some more difficulty was coming upon Christians for their faith. Wherever it falls in that spectrum, we know that Christians who received this letter, this book of Hebrews, were starting to sweat because of their faith. They were worried. And they saw an out to their persecution. They saw a way that they can get out of needing to go through suffering because of their faith. They thought, well, Jewish law and practice while we've been at odds with the Romans, is nothing compared to the at-odds Christianity has with the Roman Empire. So, it's still a part of Yahweh, God, Jesus was Jewish, he fulfilled the law. So you know what? Let's go back to the former way that we used to worship. Let's go back to the Mosaic law practices. Let's go back to where we were because at the end of the day, it's, it's all the same, right? Well, if you know Jesus' words in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so when it comes, side note, to Christianity, we need to understand that Jesus is inclusive to all, but he is exclusive that all must follow him and him alone. And he is the only way and the only truth and the only life. And he expects us to follow his way. And that might look different than our way. But he says, it's okay, come to me. So if you are of a different faith and you're here in this place or you know somebody of a different faith, walk with them, go through life with them, help them to know Jesus through your own way, through your own life, through your own words in accordance with his word. But we always must stand up and say... (laughs) This is, this is where some of you might agree or get mad. All roads don't lead to the same mountain peak. The Christian faith does not believe that. Some Christians do. Um, and I'll just outright say it's an egregious misinterpretation of the biblical text. What do you do with Jesus' words? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, yes. I don't know how you get around scriptures like that. So... That's just an important thing. We want to be known for love, but uncompromising in our convictions. And that's a difficult tension to hold. How do we show love to people that look radically different, believe radically different things from us? How are we there for them? How are we helping them? How are we bearing them up? How are we walking through suffering with them, even when they don't believe what we believe? There's a lot that we can say to that, but the author of Hebrews is saying, no matter what, when it comes to your faith lived out in the context of a pluralistic society that wants to persecute you because of your beliefs that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the answer is not to go back to where you were. It's not to give up the gospel of grace and to say, you know what, I can get by with something previous and something lesser. It's a big deal to the author author of Hebrews. So, 
ultimately what you'll see is a theme reoccurring throughout this book, that Jesus is better. A lot of individuals who have a pluralistic philosophy would be very uncomfortable with the book of Hebrews. Because Jesus goes through focusing on the Jewish faith in particular, but kind of taking a lot of their beliefs about angelic beings, about the Mosaic law, about the priestly dynasty that were only the individuals allowed to make sacrifice on behalf of the people. And he says, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. That thing that worked, that was helpful, let me tell you something, Jesus is better than that. He's better than that, and he's unashamed. In fact, scholars hold that the book of Hebrews is less like an epistle, and it's more like a sermon. Like the guy that wrote this had the intention of communicating it the way that I'm communicating it to you now, using alliterations, using little poignant points to get the point across, to be repetitive, and to say Jesus is better. Everything that once was and where you came from, it may have worked for a time, but it was never going to be the way, the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is better. Amen. That's his message. And it's, it's a pretty pointed message. I think we would even agree today. But here's the first point based on this overarching theme of the book of Hebrews. When we face adversity or suffering, we need to depend on, or no, excuse me, we depend by default on what we know to make sense of the difficulty. Right. Right. When we face difficulty, we go back to what we understand and to what we know in order to process and to make sense and to develop a game plan of how we can deal with this suffering, with this difficulty. And the author of Hebrews is pointing out, Hebrews, this is exactly what you're doing. Christians, this is exactly what you're doing. You're going back in order to make sense of and to deal with that which is uncomfortable right now. And this entire letter is a reason why you can't do that. You can't go back. So, um, I think of it in this way. Uh, I have an image. <laughs> Facebook has caught on to what I like in my stories. What are they called? They're not reels? Are they called reels on Facebook or No. Reels, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, those short things. Facebook has caught on. The algorithm has done its work. Now, it has to do with, for some reason, street fights. Can't tell you why, but I love watching street fights. Just random dudes knock the living daylight out of each other. Um, accidents, people just getting hurt. Just really bad. I know it's sadistic. They're not dying, but it's just like smack in the face with somebody running through a door, the door breaking, something like I don't know. And, believe it or not, baby kittens. Yeah. Yeah, I'm showing my colors here today. Uh, baby kittens. Specifically, kittens that are rescued off the street, and their eyes are all gunky and infected, and I'm just sitting there like, <gasps> and Evie's like, are you serious? Is it baby kittens right now? I was like, I just can't. I can't. I need another 30 second video to fulfill my heart right now and praying that I see the kittens get better as time goes on. And you see the little caption, the vet said they might die. And then all of a sudden, 10 seconds later, you see the cat's eyes opening and they're meowing and they're full and they're getting their antibiotics. I'm like, oh, yes. Yes. This is me. Um, and every once in a while, there's a video of a mother cat that's there that's sick but just gave birth to babies, and she's trying to take care of her babies. And somebody tries to come and help, but a lot of times the mother cat, because of her past and knowing how to survive, doesn't trust the hand that's coming to help her. And she hisses and she claws and she bites because all she knows is what she knows. It's the way that she survived. This is what the Hebrew, Jewish, now converted to Christian individuals who are the recipients of this letter, now facing suffering. An actual hand of the Roman Empire that isn't going to help them, that's going to hurt them, that's going to persecute them. But then there's another hand. The hand of the apostles, the hands of the followers of Jesus, the, the hands of Jesus coming in and saying, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help you. And that's Jesus. 
and that's his way. But because of what we've been used to, we want to revert to what we know that has helped us survive. And so we go back. The author of Hebrews is saying, you can't go back. Trust Jesus. So in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in the first verse, we're going to go through the first 18 verses of this chapter. Really, I would encourage you to read this book, and I would encourage you especially to read this whole chapter. Um, We're going to get through most of it. And it says this, starting in the first verse, the law is only a shadow. Law, this is what we talked about last week, it's coming up again. The law, the Mosaic law, it's only a shadow of good things that are coming. Not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins should these sacrifices have worked the way that they wanted them to work. But those sacrifices, watch this, are an annual reminder of sins. In the Mosaic Law, there were customs and rituals that they had to follow. Once a year, in particular, a high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood of a perfect spotless lamb. And this would be symbolic of individuals being cleansed of their sins. That was the symbol. But notice what the author of Hebrews is saying. That former way that you want to go back to, let me remind you about it. You had to do it year after year after year after year after year. And it was not a reminder that you're saved. It's a reminder that you're a sinner. It was a practice that was God's word and they were following it. But I think there's something happening here that that the author of Hebrews is pointing out that he's going to teach them on. And that's really that they had taken what God had originally intended for a particular purpose and they were now misusing it in order to find their own worth, in order to make sense of that which doesn't make sense. They were trying to accomplish through their own understanding and their own means and their own action and their own ability and the ability and actions of another, the high priest, that which they just can't seem to rectify, my sin my guilt, my shame, the condemnation because of my wicked ways. But they kept going back year after year. So what the author here is pointing out is that the law sacrificial system, rather than delivering worshipers from guilt, actually has the effect of reminding them of their sinfulness And therefore, their constant separation from God. Now notice this. This is an important reality. The author of Hebrews is not shaming, condemning, saying that this was wrong. He's saying that's what the law is supposed to do. Remember, it's the x-ray. It's supposed to show you what's wrong. But now they were taking that x-ray of revealing what's wrong with them and trying to make it the cure. And believe it or not, they were doing it. And what I see to be a really weird roundabout way that actually I recognize I do and we all usually do. They were becoming addicted to the feelings of guilt. I'll come back to that in a second. He says in verse 3, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder. Interesting, this is the same word the root of it that's used to describe the remembrance that's supposed to take place during the Lord's Supper. A reminder that it is because of the blood of Jesus that now my sins are forgiven and I am washed and made clean. So this, this, there's this comparison. One's not more important than the other. One doesn't outdo the other. Remember, the law is righteous and it's meant by God to show us what's unrighteous about us. The law, according to this, reminds the people of their depravity, of their sin, of the disease, of what's wrong 
but then when you jump to the Lord's Supper, that we're to practice together communally and be reminded of as we repent of our sins, recognizing what's wrong, to then say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that I am not worthless, that I am not hopeless, that I now have life and I am righteous because of you. That's the reminder of practicing the Lord's Supper in response to the reminder of our sins that the law points out. Ultimately here, the author of Hebrews is saying that the law and its practices are reminders that we can never be made perfect. The word perfect is important. We'll circle back to it. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He's getting specific here. He's addressing what the Hebrews want to go back to in order to find their worth and their identity and their fulfillment and their perfection. The author already has made the point in a previous chapter, in chapter 9, that the old sacrifices could... Watch this, that the old sacrifices could sanctify or purify people, but here he uses specific language. He says here they cannot take away, which is interesting because now we see this theological development of the difference between sanctification and justification. I don't want to get too deep into it, but ultimately sanctification is a process that we're committed to doing because of what God has already done for us. What he has already done for us is justify us, justification justification is that which we cannot do of our own accord sanctification is that which we do in conjunction with the holy spirit as he leads us he's still in the driver's seat he's still the leader in the dance and we're just in step with him but justification has nothing to do with us and that's where the author is getting at right here those practices yearly They might have purified you in a way. They might have been a process that God expected you to be involved in communally and corporately. And you were doing that. And it's great. It's purifying. It's sanctifying. But you need to understand it's not justifying. Sin was still there. This word for take away is used only one other place in the entirety of the New Testament. It's in the book of Romans by the author of Paul. And in this context as opposed to the context of Hebrews, which is saying that the sacrifices of animals could never take away sins, he uses the same word to describe how our sins are taken away. And in verses 26 and 27 of the 11th chapter of Romans, it says this, And in this way, all Israel, the Jews, but this extends to us, will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer, Jesus, Messiah, will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. These are just other words to describe the Jewish people, Zion, Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It was just revealed to us how the law in and of itself and our adherence to it will never take away our sins. But Jesus, when he comes to fulfill the law, will take away our sins. So you see how there's the comparison and the contrast happening here. Okay. Um, So this idea of removing sin, as we're going to see here as I develop it, based off of what the author writes, the idea of removing sin speaks of the burden, sin, places on the mind of the worshiper and how this removal is a lifting of a burden in a decisive, perpetually effective, justifying work and way. And ultimately, it establishes one's status before God. Jesus saying, I define your worth, and I make you worthy before God. That's what's happened. But here, it has a lot to do with our perception of his work. Mm. Jesus' work is Jesus' work, but the question is, what's going on in here and your understanding of it? How do you view that work? How do you accept that work? How do you honor that work? Do you believe that work? 
There's a lot that will go on in here. So I'm going to come back to this idea of guilt. And I said before that I think that what, what I see here is almost this addiction to going back to former ways in order to handle guilt. The author of Hebrews is looking back to a time when the Mosaic law was practiced and saying, don't go back to that because Jesus is a better way. And he goes back to it and he says, what they did would never remove their guilt. But the guilt of sin would always remain. Now, guilt, I do need to make a specific guilt. idea or understanding of, of it here. Remain. When we think of guilt, we think of a feeling, now, and it guilt, certainly I is. Need to make and we're going to come back to that. Guilt. But we need to understand idea more literally of it here. When we think from a guilt, law we perspective. The idea of being is. guilty means that you have a record, a mark, something that stands against you in a court of law. It's not just a feeling of being guilty. It's guilty because there is something that causes me to be condemned. It's not just a feeling. When Jesus comes and he fulfills the law and makes us holy and righteous, he takes away the burden or the reason why we're guilty. I think this is why it also says later, I think it's in this book or it might be in 1 Peter, um, cast all of your anxiety upon him. Another translation is your burdens. We can understand that as well to be guilt. Cast it on him because he cares for you. So I think that's where it's getting at. Okay, he's removed the burden the actual reason why you would be found guilty in a court of law, but now the feeling still remains. And I think the feeling is important because I think the feeling is showing us I'm doing something that's not congruent with Jesus' way. He died for me so that I wouldn't have to stand in condemnation because of that sinful act. And I keep struggling with that act. And I keep going back to that act. Jesus is saying, once and for all, I've taken this away, the burden of it, but we're still dealing with the guilt, and I think that's not a bad thing. But it becomes a bad thing when we don't recognize that there's no condemnation. And if we don't grasp that, then we're stuck in a constant circle of going around and around and around, and we're trying to get out, and we're handling this guilt that's based on my burden, what I needed to do, but I couldn't do, and so I feel guilty, and this is what I think the author of Hebrews is getting at here. What was meant to just be a sign that you are guilty was actually being misused as a means of false salvation. If I just go back to the temple and I get my blessing from the priest, I'm good. But I'm still guilty, but I'm good, but I'm guilty, but I'm good, but I'm guilty, but I'm good. And I, I have to go back. I have to receive. I've got to bring my sacrifices, and I've got to do my things, and I, I, I have to do. And the author of Hebrews is saying, and where did that get anybody? Nowhere. Because if it was good enough to actually remove the burden of guilt being in that court of law, no more condemnation, then you wouldn't keep going back year after year. But year after year, you go back. It's a really hard thing for us to be able to accept that in spite of my utter depravity, Jesus loves me. It's a really hard thing. Because we can't accept it. Because if it was us in the driver's seat, and somebody kept committing sinful acts against us? Mm -mm, no. Eventually, you've gone too far, and now you're not worthy of my forgiveness anymore. Let's just be real. That's how probably many of us are. It's part of the human condition. There's a limit to our grace and to our love. That's right. And so it's inconceivable for us to be able to accept the fact that that which I am incapable of showing to somebody who wrongs me certainly God is incapable of showing me who's wronged him. And so we need to make sense of this in our minds because the problem still stands. If you're a believer, you're a sinner, and you're depraved, and you need to be made righteous. And if Jesus isn't in the answer, if he isn't the answer, then you're going to find another way. And that way won't work. And the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, guys, I know you think the former way worked, but let me show you, it never worked. And if you go back to it, you're just going back to a broken system that was misused. It was never intended to be used the way that our forefathers used it. It was abused. I think guilt is the culprit. 
when we have not accepted the fact that Jesus has removed the burden, lifted the burden of guilt, now we're constantly standing in condemnation against ourselves and we get stuck. And we're doing the same thing. I got to go to church. I got to get prayer. I got to read my Bible more. I have to do this, 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 this. But the question is, when will it ever be good enough? I go back to Jesus' words. I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. It's an overstatement to make the point. You can get everything that you want to and live in your mind, the perfect life maybe. And Jesus is still saying, and it won't be enough. It's only the work of Jesus. So when we're inundated with the guilt of our sins post-Christianity, we need to be reminded of what the author is getting at here. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but Jesus is the answer. So let, let's just jump into that. Verse five, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. This is supposed to be Jesus talking to God, praying to him. Now, we know Jesus is God. It's a whole lot of difficulty to talk about the Trinity. I don't have time. You can ask me about it afterwards. But he's speaking to God, modeling for us how we should communicate with God. And he's being real. He's saying, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Jesus saying to the Father, this body is what you have prepared to make a way. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you weren't pleased. At the end of the day, it doesn't fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. There was no perfect sacrifice until Jesus. Verse 7, then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Think of Isaiah. That's who he's quoting here. Who will go? Whom will we send? And Isaiah says, hear my Lord, send me. Jesus is echoing his words and saying this was ultimately written about me because here I am in the body, the answer for humanity's problem. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, n though they were offered in accordance with the law. So what the author of Hebrews is doing right here in verse 8 is he's, he's pre he just read the verse and now he's talking about the verse, what, what I'm doing for you. So in verse 8 is his explanation, continuing. Verse 9, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. Explanation, as a good pastor does. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Verse 10, and by that will, his will, God's will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message right there. That's the gospel message right there. All of the sacrifices, all of the offerings, Jesus didn't come to show us what we were doing wrong. He was like, oh, no, no, you don't need that lamb. You need this lamb. Oh, you're wearing the wrong clothes when you go to temple. You got to wear these clothes. That's what makes you holy. Using the wrong instruments. Oh, you need more light in the temple. Oh, you know, you're not praying long enough and you're not praying hard enough. He didn't say any of that. In fact, he speaks against that. He says, God, you didn't equip me, you didn't provision me with a better way of using certain sacrifices in order to show the people how they can take their own agency and acquire their own worth and their own self-righteousness. No, you gave me a body and I'm living the perfect sinless life to be the sacrifice for them in order to accomplish for them that which they can't do on their own. Grace, sacrifice, love. That's the gospel right there. And the author of Hebrews just pointed it out for them. So verse 10, I think it's just important for us to understand, by that will, Jesus' will, his will and his will alone, we need to understand that the message of the gospel is not try harder. I pray to God that you're not hearing anything come from my lips today that communicates the message to you. Try harder, try harder, try harder. History has proven that in spite of all of the trying harder that we do, we still mess up. That's right. Some worse than others. The message of the gospel is not try harder. It's by his will. The message of the gospel were the final words out of Jesus' mouth. It is finished. Not, all right, I did this, so you got to follow in my steps and do what I did and die on this cross. He did say you'll have to take up your cross and follow me. You'll have to follow me by being an imitator of me, but your work does not make you righteous. Your work does not make you holy. You grow in your sanctification now that I have sanctified you. I have justified you, but 
The message is not try harder. It's finished. I did what you couldn't, and here it is, free for you. Accept it. The gospel. Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. It's my favorite chunk of the entire passage. If you looked at my online Bible, there's highlights all over this. And I don't highlight usually, but because there's an incredibly important comparison and contrast that we see throughout these few verses that I just read. He's going back to continue to undermine the Hebrew, the Jewish Christian idea that, you know, because of suffering and persecution, the story in my mind that I'm telling myself is I can just go back to that way. And he's coming back to that and he's saying, once again, as he did in the first few verses, let me show you why it's not equal to and it is worse than the gospel and what the gospel gives you and what Jesus has given you. And he compares a high priest to the high priest, Jesus. So I'll just break it down for you. The comparison between the priest and Jesus. For the priest, the sacrifices that are made are daily, monthly, yearly depending on the level of sacrifice and the content of the sacrifice and the theme of the sacrifice that the priest was charged to make in accordance with the Mosaic law. It was a constant thing. The author said day after day, he's making sacrifices. But for Jesus, it's a one-time event. Once and for all, Jesus made the sacrifice for sins. I'm going to save this one for last, but let's go to the next one. Um, for the high priest, it's the same sacrifices. There's a bunch of, bunch of them, different animals, different things that are given, but it's the same, always. For Jesus, it's unique. It's his body, a perfect sinless body that he gave up for us. So he doesn't need to keep going through the pantry, spinning that wheel, saying, which one do I, let's try this one, let's try this one, let's try this one. Nope, I got exactly what you need right here. It's right. this, my body, perfect. The sacrifices made daily in their diversity by the high priest, according to the author right here, can never take away sins. He repeats it. These sacrifices never take away sins. They don't. Jesus and his perfect sacrifice took away sin once and for all. Now here, here's, here's where I think the picture, the imagery is so so good. It's so powerful. Notice the posture, the literal posture of the priest versus Jesus. It said specifically, let me read it for you, day after day, the every, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. There was no seat within the tabernacle except the, the, the most holy inner of inner place where the Ark of the Covenant, which was considered to be the, the mercy seat, the throne of God. So there was only one seat that was taken. That was reserved for God and it, where his presence would be seated on earth. But for the high priests and their work, there was no seat to be had. There was the showroom, the table, the menorah, the basins, the altars. There were so many things that made up the, the holy tabernacle, except for a seat for the priests to sit on. And I think what the author is getting at here is he's trying to make a point to say that the priest's work is never done. He is constantly going and moving and doing and trying in order to accomplish. What's the posture of Jesus? I'm going to read it for you. He's not standing. But when this high priest, Jesus, offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God 
And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. This is the reality of it is finished. Jesus didn't bring any half measures. Jesus didn't come in order to do something only part of the way. Jesus isn't scurrying about trying to do X, Y, and Z in order for our sins to be taken care of and for us to be made righteous. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's kicking his feet up on his enemies. It's finished. No more work needs to be done for my creation's worth. I've done all that needs to be done. It's my favorite contrast here. So the point is this. Jesus gets the job done. Only he can finish what we started. Us as sinners, we dug ourselves into this ditch. And the more we try, the digger we deep. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I've done what you need. It's finished. So I come back to this idea of perfection. Because he's saying these laws, they won't make you perfect. You're following them, they won't make you perfect. But Jesus, he will make you perfect. He says it later on. So the idea of perfection here is not the idea that you need to, in all of your conduct, need to measure up and be perfect like following the law. The idea is not that once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you commit to follow him, that all of your problems, all of your struggles, all of your addictions, all of your missteps, all of your mistakes, they're just going to radically disappear. That is not the message of the gospel. That, that's a lie that sets people up for failure. The idea here, verse 14, for by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Holy. He's made you perfect in this process of holiness. Your starting point is I'm worthy now because Jesus has said so. Not because of anything I've done or will do. He said so. I'm worthy. That's my worth. And as I'm on this journey of growing to be more holy, to imitate him, to take up my cross and follow him, I have this as my starting point. So when that guilt comes up and I'm overwhelmed, I need to remember my starting point is he said I'm worthy. He says I'm worthy. So I don't need to get stuck in this trap of, well, am I really a Christian? Am I worthy of God? Am I doing enough? The gospel is not, try harder. It's, it is finished. So don't get caught in that trap. And I'm preaching to myself, okay? Just want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, I'm preaching to myself. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary atonement, an act in order to be considered worthy and righteous. It's no longer needed because of the act of Jesus on the cross once for all. He's kicking back in heaven right now with God. It's finished. It's done. Walk in it. Live in it. Accept it. Believe it. I want to make this point. The work of Christ applies to more than just your past. Our pasts haunt us, I know. But you have to recognize that the gospel is not just liberating you from your past, but it liberates you once for all, for all time before the Lord, when you trust in him. He says in verse 17 that God remembers no more. I don't want to get too technical, but I don't believe at all that, and many scholars don't agree that this is the idea that God literally forgets it. Like, oh, you you did that on this date, on this time? Oh, I don't remember. He's an omniscient God. He doesn't. What's more powerful, I think more powerful than trying to categorize God as 
choosing to be ignorant is that God says, I know exactly what you did and I've already forgiven you for it. No matter how much you've wronged me or others, I've forgiven you. That's so much more of a powerful message than, oh, you did that? Oh, no big deal. I've forgotten about it already. No, I remember what you did, but I've forgiven it. I don't hold it against you anymore. That's the agreed upon interpretation in, in the scholarly field, at least. The sin you're constantly reminded of, God says, I will remember no more. And the sin that you have yet to accomplish, I remember no more. I forgive you. So in summary, we have a problem with sin. There's no question. We can all probably say amen to that. And I think it's important that we do. Jesus talks extensively about repentance. Turn back to me. You can't pretend that sin isn't there. The law shows it. And now he says, the law is written on your hearts and your minds. Even if you don't know the word, you're going to know if what you're doing is not God's way. And that God says, I will remember it no more. The very things that you do that contradict the law that I have placed in your hearts and your minds. So we have a problem with sin, and that problem of sin has been dealt with in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Christ's work is a decisive final act that has dealt with sin by which followers of Jesus are made perfect forever. I told you we need to be careful to not think about perfection as meeting all these requirements and measures. The idea of perfection in the Hebrew and in the Greek here has the idea of wholeness, completeness. I think when we have unresolved tension surrounding sin, we have guilt, and guilt leads to shame, and shame leads to isolation, and then we feel like we are all by ourselves trying to figure out our mess. But because of the work of Christ, you're not fragmented. You're not partial. You're not broken anymore. You are made whole, perfect. Not in deed, but in worth. So here's where I want us to close. Um, I'm going to read verses 19 through 25. And I just want you to see how powerful of a response the author of Hebrews says. Uh, the response that he gives the, the recipients of his letter to, to take. Because remember, they're facing persecution. And there's the reality that it's going to get worse. We know historically it did get worse. And the temple was destroyed and most of Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. It got really rough for Christians and for Jews. hasn't quite gotten there, but it's on the brink. The temptation that has been addressed by the author is don't go back. Don't go back. Trust the hand of Jesus. Trust what he has done for you once and for all and what he's giving you freely. Trust him. I know it's difficult. I know you, you've gotten used to a certain way of survival. You've got to trust him. And here's what he says really is our response. So here's what you can do. If you want an action step, if you want to, well, then what do we do? Because I get that I accept it, but I've got to do something, <laughs> right? Here's what he says, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, that which only the high priest could enter, we all can enter now because God has made us worthy. He's torn the veil top to bottom. By a new and living way, he opened for us through the curtain. That is his body his work. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, he's, re, he's summarizing why we can be confident and walk in confidence yeah. that I'm a new creation in yeah. Christ. I am worthy. I am holy because of his work. So here's what you do. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. The full assurance. Draw near to God. Wait, 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 wait. 
The imagery he's using there is, is ridiculous for a Jew to hear who practices the Mosaic law. Nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. In fact, the high priest would have a bell tied around him and a rope tied around him so that if he walked in and he was found to be unworthy, he would drop dead. And they would hear the bell and they'd know they'd have to drag him out. And now the author of Hebrews is saying, metaphorically, you get to enter the real deal. That tabernacle is just the shadow of what is. Now, approach the throne of God boldly. That's hard. That's hard for them to hear. And that's why he's saying you got to go back to Jesus. You got to know who Jesus is. You've got to depend on the work of Jesus for your life. Otherwise, yes, it doesn't make any sense, but that gives you the courage and the boldness. So let us draw near with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. That which you went in the old ways to fulfill your life, Jesus has done. So approach the throne of God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises faithful. So what's the next action step? Not just draw near to God. Don't go back. Don't go back. Hold unswervingly. This is the word. This is the answer. In spite of everything that's happening to you, Christians, in spite of everything that's working against you, Christian man, Christian woman, hold unswervingly. Verse 24, and let us consider, I love this, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of approaching. I think this is really important because while I think broadly you can take toward, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, the the context of saying, okay, here's the last thing you do. Keep gathering together. What's the one thing that's declining in this country? Spiritual gathering, communal gathering, not just in a church, but but in in, in any venue and in any setting. It's at an all-time low. It's the very thing that Satan doesn't want us to be doing. And especially as the church, The author of Hebrews is saying, don't forsake, don't give up community, gathering together. Here's why. Because in community, you have the opportunity to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let me ask you, when you are inundated with the weight of guilt and you are feeling so much shame and feeling no worth at all, what's the last thing you want to do? Be around people. Guilt that has not allowed Jesus to take the weight of the guilt, leads to shame. Shame, I believe, is a social tool. I believe it has its place necessarily, but here it's misused. It can be misused. Where now, because of my guilt that hasn't been addressed by the work of Jesus, I haven't allowed it to, I haven't accepted Jesus, now I want to isolate myself from everybody because I don't want to be around them because I don't want them to see my dirt. And Jesus says, you're all dirty. There is no one righteous, no, not one. So what would it look like if we were able to come together and in spurring one another on toward love and good deeds are vulnerable with each other? You had a bad week, so did I. I get it. I'm with you. Let's give it to God. Let's get on our knees. Let's repent and praise him. Repent. Okay, so here's where I'm bringing it in. If we can't accept the work of Christ on our behalf, then the guilty conscience remains. That's why we have to accept his work. The feelings of guilt still will arise. I think those are necessary. They're there to remind you, hey, I'm off, and thank you, Jesus. So this is the, this is the tension. I said there was tension last week, and here's the current tension. It's, it's not that clean, but it, I think it's important. Failure to repent is pretending that you don't need help. If I don't repent, I don't need help. I don't need help. I make my own destiny. I define my own worth. My truth is my truth. And who's going to tell me otherwise? Sounds fun on a micro level, but on a macro level, we know how that can destroy nations. So failure to repent is pretending that you don't need help. And... Failure to accept the grace of Jesus is to say that he isn't enough. When he is all that you'll ever need. 
when he's the answer. When you're lost in the dark and you feel like you are utterly worthless, like you are trash. Jesus says, no. Why would I die if I didn't think otherwise for you? What was the point of the cross if it wasn't for me to show you how worthy I find you of my love? And now you are worthy because of my work. So the tension, we've got to have humble hearts. We've got to recognize that we still do things that are off and that we've got to gather together. We've got to be a community that spurs one another on toward love and good deeds. And we've got to accept Jesus. Christian man and woman, we've got to accept Jesus. Daily, we've got to be reminded. It's his work, not mine, that puts me in right standing with God. So thank you, Jesus. To the unbeliever, it's Jesus and Jesus alone that will pick you up out of the dark, who will set you on the path to heaven, who will guide you into all truth, who will make meaning of your life. There's no promise of riches in this world. There's no swindling. There's no parlor tricks. It's just a straightforward, logical answer. Jesus. I want to invite you to stand with me on your feet as we close. Father, I thank you this day for your word that has been declared, for what you have taught us. And Lord, right now I'm praying for hearts in this place that are so burdened by the weight, the weight of the lie of the enemy that's telling people that they're hopeless and that they're worthless. You have said otherwise, Jesus. And when you sat down, you really proved it's finished. And nothing can undo the work that you have done for us. So Jesus, so Jesus, I pray you would help us to dispel the lie of the enemy. And I pray that we would walk in grace. And in Jesus' name, the people of God said, amen, amen. Amen. All right, before you go, um, we want to make one final announcement for the day. That is this weekend is the GT Masterclass with Dr. Michael Caparelli. He will be speaking on Saturday about anger with aim. That's the title that he's given us, talking about w directing our anger. We all deal with anger. We all have it, but we want it to be pointed in the right direction um, because God can use it in that way. So that's going to be Saturday from 1030 to 130. But prior to that, on Friday night, up here, right in the sanctuary, 7 o'clock, right, to 8 o'clock is going to be a prayer time. We ask that you would bring your anger, <laughs> um, not towards us. Uh, bring your anger, bring your frustration, bring the things that you deal with, that we all deal with, and let's bring them before God. Let's prepare ourselves, and let's ask that God would prepare those who are going to come um, that Saturday. And then as well, Sunday, if you come normally on Sundays, great, come again. Uh, this is not something you want to miss. You might tell me, Pastor Chase, I want to miss this. No, this is not something you want to miss. So Sunday, regular service time, 1030, um, Dr. Caparelli will be sharing with us again. All right? Amen. Final thing is that we have invite cards um, that are in the back. I know they're on the tables in the back. Um, last chance to invite people. This is going to be a great event. If you have not registered yet, QR code right now. You scan it right now. It takes you right there to register. Just put the number of attendees, your name, your email address. If you also invited somebody who you know is coming, but they haven't registered, you can either tell them or just do it for them. Um, but either way, that just helps us for a count so that we can make this event the best it possibly can be. Amen? Amen. All right. That is all. We're just going to close and have a wonderful Sunday. All right? Amen.